Good afternoon and welcome back. We're going to continue with early modern English today and we're going to start into some of the linguistic aspects of it focusing on syntax and morphology. Um, first I'll give just a brief introduction of some of the linguistic features that we'll see throughout this unit um, and then we'll focus on the syntax aspects and morphology aspects. Um, so some of the most important linguistic features that we see during this time period as we're moving from Middle English into something that's much more recognizable to us um, is the morphology will start to look a lot like present day English, but still has a lot that's similar to late Middle English. So we'll see sort of a transition period where some of it might still seem a little bit archaic, but some of it is going to start looking a lot more similar to what we see today. Um, there's a continued weakening of the strong verbs, so we're continuing to lose those strong verbs um, until we're left with pretty much all that we have left in uh, present day English. With syntax, we'll see that early modern English is pretty much very similar to present day English. There's not that many differences. There's a little bit more flexibility than what we have today, but it's already gotten much more stable and much more rigid um, by the time we get to this period. With lexicon, we're starting to borrow a lot of words again. So during Middle English, a lot of our words are borrowed from French and some from Latin. We're going to be starting to borrow even more from things like Latin and Greek as technology increases, as medical things increase. Um, we're also going to start seeing a lot of loan words from non-Indo-European languages, um, especially during the time of colonization. Um, so that will be one of the important reasons why we get a lot of words that are not from other Indo-European languages that we have had long-term contact with. And then phonology, which we'll cover mostly in the next lectures, um, will focus mostly on the great vowel shift. This is a huge, huge change to what we saw uh, in the sound system. So Middle English vowels will match similarly to what we saw in the IPA. The great vowel shift is going to change our vowels very, very significantly during this time period. And we'll see that mostly in the next lecture. We also get a few new sounds that become phonemic rather than just being allophones. Um, and so we'll see some additional sounds sort of become uh, possible as well. Focusing though on syntax first, we'll notice that the syntactic rigidity is increasing during this time and so it's continuing to increase in how rigid it is and how we get to what we see in present day English, but it's still a little bit more flexible. There's still a little bit of, of change, uh, changes and differences that are possible during this time. Um, SVO ordering has been well established by this time. It was already pretty well established in Middle English and we start seeing a really incre uh, rise in complex verbal constructions um, including tense and aspect during this time where things are turning into phrasal verbs we see a lot more of those more complex constructions starting to evolve and starting to emerge during this time period if we look at noun phrases we'll notice that there's not that much that's changed in noun phrases from the middle english time period we uh, can still have a demonstrative adjective and possessive adjective next to nouns so atheists will ever be talking of that their opinion so this is something that some dialects can still use in present day english but in most dialects of present day english you would end up saying that opinion of theirs and put that into a prepositional phrase this is something that was still commonly seen in early modern english Adjective modifiers can still uh, follow nouns, as in Middle English, so something we don't really see in present day English. So faith invincible, a means convenient, a line royal, um, is something where you can still put the adjective after the noun. We don't really see that ever in uh, present day English, so this is something that still is common, but is starting to change during this time period. Noun adjuncts also become more common where you can use nouns to describe other nouns, so things like neighborhood broker, sugar almonds, merchant goods, where you're using a noun to sort of function as an adjective um, is something that becomes more common during this time period as well. With adverbials, we see that it's still very common to insert an adverbial modifier in between the auxiliary verb and a past participle during this time period. So, and was by them examined rather than and was examined by them, which he behind him left versus which he left behind him is again come together rather than is come together again. And these are things that you can still occasionally hear um, in present day English, but most of the time we prefer to move them after the noun rather than in between the um, auxiliary verb and the main verb in these constructions. Double negatives become less common um, in early modern English, but they're still acceptable around until about, about the 18th century or so. And there are still dialects in present day English that use double negatives. This is something that we saw in Middle English was very common, very natural to English. But due to the prescriptive changes that happened during the early modern time period, we see this fall by the wayside and not used very frequently, especially in more standardized dialects during this time period. With first phrases, 
we'll notice that there's going to be an increase in some of the complexity, um, but they had some of the same kinds of tense and aspect systems used similarly to what we see today. So more, more complexity than what Middle English had, but not quite as much as what we see in present day English. Um, this, during the early part of modern English, they were starting to use be rather than have for an auxiliary verb. Um, have becomes more popular later, and we can see a variety of this and sort of it in flux during the time of Shakespeare, where Shakespeare would have used both. So an example would be this gentleman is happily arrived versus I have since arrived. These are both examples from Shakespeare. So you can see some variation in the usage during this time period have eventually wins out and becomes the one that we use during those constructions. A progressive aspect, our ing ending, is fully developed by the end of the 16th century. We still don't see it used nearly as often as we see it in present-day English. We use the progressive for lots and lots of things today. Um, during this time, it would have been established, it would have been possible, but it wasn't used quite as widely as what we see in present-day English. We also see the simple present used in early modern where the progressive is needed now in present day English. So it's not used as often then, and in some cases where we would have to use it now, um, it still wasn't quite used then. So Clifford, dost thou know who speaks to thee? We would have to say who is speaking to thee in present day English. Um, we can still interpret that and understand what's being said, but in our uh, present day um, usage of the language, we would use the progressive um, aspect in that case. And then finally, the perfect and the progressive are common in early modern English, but the combination of the two of them together is still relatively rare. So something like I have been watching you is not a construction we would have really seen in early modern English yet, but that's a perfectly sensible one that we would see without really thinking much of it during uh, present day English and today's English. Some other stuff about word phrases also. The progressive passive is starting to be developed during the late 18th century, so you are being watched um, is something that starts to develop. But we don't really see as many of these super complex constructions until present day English and modern English. So something like you have been being watched is something that we don't really see during this time period yet, but by the time we get to modern English and by the time we get to today, it is something that you can say, even though this is also still not very common. We don't hear this all that often, and it might even still sound a little bit strange to some of you. Um, but I, there have been examples of this. I've heard some examples like a friend when I lived in San Francisco saying Muni has been being really slow lately. So it is an example that does exist in our language, but it's still not a very common one. Most of the time we're still using most of our most common things, you know, simple present, simple past are still the vastly most common ones that we see. The use of do as a dummy word is something that starts to become common. So it can be used for a para paraphrastic or sort of um, adding some emphasis. So the cry did knock against my heart um, rather than saying the cry knocked or using as a dummy auxiliary for forming negatives or for forming questions. So you could hear, I doubt it not, or I do not doubt it um, in Shakespeare. So both of them are seen during the Shakespeare's time. So you can see that's starting to emerge, but not used as consistently yet during the early modern time period. Whereas this is something that we use very frequently to create negatives, to create questions. Why do you look on me is something that we would say um, very naturally in present day English. We also see some of what we would call quasi-modals continue to develop. These are sort of phrasal modals um, that they're not quite as sophisticated as present day English, but these are things that are starting to grammaticalize and turn into more of a function uh, use rather than a content use. So be going to um, used for the future starts to emerge during this time, have to for being obliged to, needing to do something, um, to be about to for it's not quite happening, but it will happen soon, used to is another example. These are developing during this time, but not used as frequently as what we would see in present day English. Within clauses, we'll start seeing that it's going to have a little bit more flexibility, especially early on in early modern English, but it's going to eventually emerge into something that looks very similar to our present day structures. So SVO order was fairly well established in, early, in Middle English, and it still is something that we see even through early modern and into today. But there is still a little bit of flexibility. So in the late 17th century, um, you might still have seen some environments for um, the use of some of these constructions, I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing, um, where you don't have that do sort of dummy thing there yet with that negative, um, rather than saying something like, um, nor do I deny anything. So there's still some of that double negative, there's still some of that um, lack of the do sort of dummy phrase. Um, and we'll start seeing 
some of these things start to fall by the wayside, but you still see some of the subject object verb, some of the verb subject object, some of the object fronting. And we still do some of these today in specific uh, statements and specific uses. Um, so the subject object verb as the law should them direct is still something that's left over from Middle English that we still see in early modern that we don't really do very frequently anymore. Um, some verb fronting, so how hast thou offended? Um, were he my kinsman? Um, these are things that you might still see in direct questions or in conditional statements, so the sort of subjunctive concept, which still exists in present day English, but is falling away and we're not really seeing much use of the subjunctive anymore. So that's something that's also still found in early modern that we might occasionally hear in present day English, but not nearly as much as you might have found it during this time period, or to front um, an object for something like emphasis. In terms of morphology, there's little that's happening here compared to what we've seen in past um, examples. So most of the morphological changes already happened, and so what's left to change in early modern English is what's found in the pronoun system. By this time, almost all of the other inflectional uh, endings are lost. The remaining forms are pretty much the same as what we still see today, with the exception of sort of gaining the progressive that happened during this time period. And so some of the changes that are left are just in the pronoun stem itself. So with personal pronouns, this is the period of time where we start capitalizing I um, at, for the first person pronoun. Um, we start seeing a distinction in my and mine, thy and thine, um, and those kinds of distinctions still exist today. Um, and this becomes more of a phonological distinction where the ein forms are used um, before something like an H or a pause, a my or thy um, would be used before consonants. Um, we've sort of changed some of those um, patterns where my would be something that you would use as a possessive, mine would be something you're using as a pronoun specifically without any sort of um, noun attached to it. Um, and so this is the change that we start seeing um, until about the 18th century is when that change happens to where we see it more closely to what we see in present day English. And this is spread through most of the pronomial system as well. So some of the ex exceptions to this are his and its. Um, so those are still um, things that we would use as pronouns by themselves and not only as um, the possessive form. We lose the second person plural, so thou, um, during this time period, which created a little bit of a gap in English. And there's a shift in the usage of things like thou and ye. And so this began to be used as a singular form. So this is imitating the sort of tu vu kind of distinction that um, was imitated from 13th century French. This is something that languages like Spanish and French still do, where they would use the second person form as a formal sort of form. Um, Shakespeare started to use some of these forms for affects, so thou forms are more affectionate than the you forms, um, and eventually they became more considered upper class by the 16th century. And so we're starting to see a shift in this usage of the second person plural, and what ends up happening is that we end up getting rid of that completely and just using you as what was the second person plural into the singular, and we sort of lose that second person plural distinction. The neuter form in the 16th century started to create into a, just a third person kind of form as its. So the older nominative and objective forms like hit with the H is lost, it's non-standard. We still see some people such as Queen Elizabeth I still using this form, but we end up losing that H from it and we just get what we have today like it and its. Um, with ye and you, the old distinction between nominative or subject ye, accusative or object you, starts being lost in colloquial speech and you ends up uh, prevailing by the 16th century, although we still see some mentions of it, so things like the King James Bible still use ye. Um, we start seeing the endings for person and number simplified during this time period as well. So they're lost in the first person and infinitive forms, making them identical, so I walk versus to walk for example, would make them look exactly the same. We don't have endings for that anymore. We still have at some point during the early modern period the maintenance of an est form for the second, so thou goest, for instance, um, which starts to fade out. So something like the King James Bible would still maintain this, but we start seeing that fade out during this time period until it falls by the wayside completely, whereas the third person form varied between an s or an eth, the S eventually prevails during this time, and this is the only person and number inflection that we still have left in English today. So I walk versus he walks is the sort of last remaining piece of this sort of inflection um, that we still have in present day English. With some of the
particular kinds of pronouns, we see the present day system of demonstrative and interrogative pronouns starting to develop during this time period. There's not a lot of changes that have been made to this system. So during um, present day English, whether is only used as a conjunction, as in like whether or not. Historically, this was a question, so meaning which of two, so whether of them is the planar. Um, so thinking of which of them, for instance, um, which we do still use as an interrogative, as a question sort of construction. But whether now, we just use this as a, as a conjunction. Which and who start becoming relative pronouns and they start joining uninflected that. So this was introduced in Middle English to replace the they. Um, and so we're starting to see that what was happening in Middle English continues into early modern English and becomes nearly identical to what we have in present day English. And then finally, just a few other little things in morphology. Some of the reflexive pronouns start becoming more frequent. So we saw in Old English the use of self not as a reflexive pronoun, but used as more of a reference kind of pronoun. But combining self with those personal pronouns to be reflexive, to refer back to oneself, is becoming more frequent and starting to look more and more like what we see in present day English. Some of the older forms are still in practice, where you're using a pronomial form instead of a reflexive, so get thee a good husband. Um, but then you do still also see that stores up to thyself a good reward, or I will shelter me here versus if I drown myself wittingly. So we're seeing a mix in Shakespeare's time of the older form where we don't see that reflexive self pronoun versus also in Shakespeare using that self pronoun. So we're starting to see that become more frequent and we can see that sort of influx during this time. The comparatives are also something that starts changing where we start seeing a, a system much more similar to present day English, where the ER and EST endings um, are still there, but we're starting to see this use of the analytical comparative with mo for more. Um, and so something like uh, red versus redder or beautiful versus more beautiful that we would see in present day English, um, we're starting to see that develop during this time period. And th there's also some times where you can kind of see both of them being used where we get this double comparatives such as more stronger, um, something that we would see as not uh, standard in present day English, but that you might still hear some people say. So that gives a good summary of the syntax, the morphology of the early modern period. We'll look in future lectures at the phonology, the great vowel shift, which will be a much more intense uh, discussion about the sound changes that were very severe. Um, but if you have any questions, as always, send an email, schedule office hours, bring those questions to class, and we'll be able to talk about them together.